All right. Well, good morning, everybody. So glad to have all of you here this morning. Uh, I do have to say I don't recognize about half of you. So uh, my name is Shaheen, and uh, like Leah said here anyway, uh, I'm the campus pastor of our Isani location, and I've been over there for about a year and a half, and God is doing some really great things over there, but I'm happy to be with you this morning, and so glad that you could make it out. I also do want to welcome those of you in Isani, my people. I hope you are enjoying your time over there. I hope you are experiencing God's presence, and uh, be sure and tell Jeremy thank you for hosting the service. And one other thing, I know that Pastor Kevin is there with you today, so when you tear down, make sure he does all the heavy lifting. So you, you watch out that for me. And, uh, and those of you watching online in our app, YouTube, website, whatever it might be, so glad you could join us as well. Uh, we are starting this new series today, a three-week series called You Asked For It, where we are going to answer your questions about God, faith, life, the Bible, dinosaurs, shoe size, whatever it might be. We are going to answer your questions. And so if you're a guest with us today, uh, you really did pick a good day to come and check out a service. You're going to kind of get an inside scoop into what we wonder about as a church and what we think about. So the first question we're going to look at today is this. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? We told you nothing was off limits. And so we're going to answer this one, but really quick. So everybody hang on real tight. Woodchuck doesn't actually chuck wood. Woodchuck is another name for a groundhog. Groundhogs don't do anything with wood. They just burrow holes and they dig out dirt. But a mathematician did a study one time that the amount of dirt that the average groundhog or woodchuck digs out of a hole, that volume, if it were equal to the weight in wood, would be 700 pounds. So next time somebody asks you how much wood could a woodchuck chuck, if a woodchuck could chuck wood, you tell them 700 pounds and then slap them and walk away. I don't know what the relevance of that last part was. I just picture it as being really funny in my mind. So that's it. Let's pray. Let's go home. Just kidding. Hey, in all seriousness, there were some really great questions that have already come in, and hopefully you're going to continue submitting them. But what I want to do today is I want to take a look at three different questions that came in, and they all deal with basically the same issue from different angles. And so I want to kind of look at the bigger picture of these three questions, and then we'll look at the specifics of each one towards the end of the message. But the three questions that we're going to look at today are this. What about the people who believe in God but don't go to church? Are they going to hell or are they going to heaven? It's a great question. Maybe you're wondering that right now. The next one. What happens to babies after they die? Since they haven't sinned, are they separated from God? Or are they born into sin and therefore doomed? Again, that's one that we got to ponder and think about. And the last one that we're going to look at today is this. What happens to someone when they die if they were baptized and confirmed as a child? Now, all three of these questions, again, basically come at it from different angles and use different words or different avenues. But when you boil it down, all three of these questions are dealing with the topic of eternal security. Eternal security. How can you and I be sure that someone we loved or that someone we knew went to heaven? How can we be sure that our parents did or that our brother did or that a friend from high school, whatever it might be, or, or to even personalize, hey, how can I be sure that I'm going to go to heaven when I die? And any time that we talk about this idea of eternal security, I think, at least on the surface, it's really something that unifies us as people. Whether, whether you're a guest here today or you've been coming for a while, whether you're a church person or you're not, maybe you're wondering about God, no matter where we find ourselves, this idea or this, these questions about eternal security, we all wonder about. We all wonder what happens after we die. We all wonder, if there is a heaven, how do I make sure and get there? We all wonder, am I going to be good enough to make the cut? How do I make sure and get a ticket? And so it's really something, again, wherever you find yourselves, that we can all relate to. But also, with these questions, I think they really highlight a huge chasm between what we say we believe and what we actually wonder about in our hearts, what we ponder. There's like a, almost this, this contention between the two, or like this dichotomy between what we say we believe, what we want to believe, what we hope we believe, and what we secretly wonder in our hearts. Because on this hand, I have never been to a funeral 
where anybody has ever went to hell. And neither have you. No matter what type of person they were, whether they were good or bad, young, old, male, female, rich, poor, it seems like everyone goes to heaven and that's what we say. Hey, they, you know what? They're in a better place. So we say that and we want to believe it. But there's this chasm then, there's this separation between, man, but I really do wonder. When we're not at a funeral, when we're not at a memorial service, how do I get to heaven? What's the right steps to get there? Am I going to make it? And so there's this, there's this tension that's created between the two, this tension that becomes unmanageable, a tension that becomes worrisome, a tension that causes a lot of insecurity and uncertainty in our lives. I want to believe and I, I say that everyone goes to heaven, but I'm not really sure. What is it baptism? Is it confirmation? What about kids? And we have all these questions that come up about the idea of eternal security. But the good news is that we're not the only ones who have felt this before. These aren't questions just for us today in 2016. It's been asked throughout the centuries, throughout history. And even when Jesus was here on this earth, he had to deal with these questions and these ponderings and people wondering about eternal security. Even from his closest friends, the 12 disciples, he talked about this over and over again. And there's one particular point the night that Jesus is going to be arrested, when he gathers his 12 guys around for something that we call the Last Supper. And he gathers them there, and they're having dinner together, and Jesus is really kind of giving out his final message. He's doing like his grand finale teaching, guys, if there's anything I want you to know, it's this. If there's, if there's anything that I want to define you as my followers, then it's got to be this one thing. And he's going on and on, and one of the topics he brings up is about this idea of heaven, and he tells his 12 guys sitting around, there's, there's 11 at the time, actually, technically, <clears throat> but he tells them, hey, guys, I'm going to be leaving here soon. I'm going to be leaving, leaving on a jet plane. Maybe if you knew Steve Miller back then, I don't know. But he tells them, I'm going to be leaving, and you can't come with me. And then he says this, found in John chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now put yourself in the disciples' shoes when he says this. They're sitting around a table, and here's Jesus, who they've spent incredible amounts of time with for the past three years. I mean, he is the man, he is their leader, he is their mentor. They have seen him, you know, heal sick people. They've seen him give sight to the blind. They've seen him um, feed thousands of people at a time, walk on water. They've seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. We talked about that last week. I mean, incredible things. And Jesus says, hey, guys, uh, I'm leaving good luck, you can't come with me. And he says, don't be troubled. Like, wait a minute, Jesus. How am I not supposed to be troubled in this? How am I not supposed to be worried? I mean, what's going on? But he goes on and he finishes this thought. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Like, obviously, guys, trust me here. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So Jesus says, hey, guys, don't worry. I'm going to heaven. Everything's going to be fine. Don't be troubled. I know you might be worked up and a little tizzy right now, but just hold your horses. It's going to be okay. And then he finishes by saying this sentence. You know the way to the place where I am going. Hey, guys, I'm a... I'm heading out, mic drop, end of the thing, and uh, you know, you got it, don't worry. I mean, I know we've talked about it, I know you got questions about it, but don't worry, you'll figure it out. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And I, I can just imagine the disciples at the time are like, hey, do you know where he's going? I don't know where, like, how do we get to these same questions that you and I have about how do we get to heaven, how are we sure about it? They were having these same questions, and luckily, one of his disciples was brave enough to speak out at the time. His name was Thomas. And this is what Thomas said. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Okay, so maybe he was texting or missed the whole part about heaven. I don't know. We don't know where you're going. or Maybe he's slow. So how can we know the way? Jesus, how do I know the way? I know you've talked about it. I know I've seen some things and I've heard some things, but how do I get to heaven again? You're, you're telling me you're going to leave and you're just going to hope that I meet you there someday? 
You're going to hope that I figure out whether to take a right or a left at this intersection? How do I get there? And this question that Thomas, oh, sorry, go back. This question that Thomas asked is the one that we ask so often in all our different various forms. Hey, what if I don't go to church? Is that how I get there? What if, it, what if it's a child? What if I was baptized? All these different questions. We have wonderings and, and ponderings and insecurity about what happens in eternity. And I know you might have just saw a little preview. Hopefully you didn't read it all yet. But <clears throat> Jesus' answer to Thomas's question is incredibly simple, incredibly profound, incredibly direct and to the point. And if you're a church person, if you grew up in church or maybe you're familiar with the Bible, then you probably already know what the answer is, what Jesus is going to say. You might have even memorized this verse. I don't know. But I want to encourage you to look at it through a new lens today, through the lens of here's how we can be sure of what happens when we die and how we get to heaven. And likewise, if you're not a church person, if you're not a Christian, if maybe you're just kind of exploring this whole God thing, you're seeing what it's all about, Jesus' answer might seem super simple, might seem pretty narrow-minded. It might seem like it's too easy. There's got to be more. This is contrary from everything that I've been taught in life. But again, I want to encourage all of us together to take a look at Jesus' answer as, as we question our eternal security. Thomas says, how do I get there? And Jesus says this, I am the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father or no one gets to heaven except through me. Plain and simple, pure, easy, no confusion, whatever. I am the way. As Thomas and probably the other disciples there sitting there thinking, hey, Jesus, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way how to get there? Jesus cuts right to the chase and says, guys, this is it. This is what it all comes down to. Put your faith in me. Put your trust in me. Trust that I am the way to get you to heaven. Nothing else. It's through me. Now, when Jesus was addressing the, the, the disciples at this point in the Last Supper and when he was answering Thomas's question, he hadn't yet died on the cross and risen from the grave. And so Thomas didn't necessarily have the whole context or the, the big picture of the story. But we do. As God inspired other men to write out the rest of the letters and documents of the New Testament, every single letter, every single book highlights the grace and the faith that we, we get through putting our trust in Jesus. And one of the most famous guys, his name was the Apostle Paul. He wrote churches, or he wrote letters to churches all over the Mediterranean. And in every single one, he keeps hammering the same point. But I just want to read a few of them to us this morning so that we can really wrap our minds around how do we get to heaven? How can we be sure? How can we kind of subdue these questions we have about eternal security? So to a church in Rome, the Apostle Paul writes this. But now... A righteousness from God or a, a right standing with God, being made right in his sight, the ability to go to heaven. That's what this righteousness from God. Apart from the law, apart from anything that you or I can do, apart from any behaviors we can have, apart from our good outweighing our bad, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify, basically the old world system or the, the old way of doing things. This righteousness, this right standing from God, comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. Comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption or the being made right with God again that came by Christ Jesus. Now, we don't have time today to get into this whole sin issue. Uh, it would take way too long, but if you have questions, I would love to talk to you after service. Please don't leave, or there in Isani, I know Kevin would love to talk to you, or you can submit a question through our app, and we'll answer it in a couple weeks. But taking out that part, <clears throat> our ability to go to heaven, 
our ability to be connected with God, the way that we can know for sure that we are able to go to heaven when we die comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. No other ways. And he says it's apart from the law. It's apart from the old way. I, mean, I know that every other world religion teaches that it, it rests on our behaviors, on our good outweighing our bad. Even some branches, you call them, of Christianity teach us that we have to do good things, that we have to go through certain ceremonial or religious traditions. But the Bible clearly says that's not it at all. It's one way, through faith in Jesus, through trusting in him. The Apostle Paul writes another letter to a church in Ephesus, and he says this, he's hammering the same sort of point again. For it is by grace you have been saved, and here's the key words, through faith, not through good behaviors, not through trying, not through trying to be sincere enough, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, nothing that we can do. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The same sort of thing. Paul is telling the, the church in Ephesus, hey, how do you want to know that you're going to go to heaven when you die? How do you want to know that, that you're going to be connected to God? It's through faith. It's through trusting in what Jesus did for you, not by works. You don't, we don't get to heaven by saying, hey, God, I did enough good things. Hey, God, I... I, I I told the line, I measured up to the mark. Hey, God, look at how many people I fed or look at how much money I gave or how much time I served or whatever that might be. That's not it at all. The questions we have about eternal security are answered through faith in Christ. One more verse, the same thing Paul is emphasizing. He just writes it to a different church. We who are Jews by birth, he's talking about himself, it was his nationality, and not sinful Gentiles, again, we can talk about that later, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. We are not made right with God by doing good things or by having good behavior, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith, we may be made right with God, that we can be sure that we go to heaven when we die, in Christ, and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. There is nothing that we can do to try and earn a spot in heaven. There's no action we can take. There's not enough good we could do to outweigh our bad. The issue of our eternal security all comes down to our faith in Jesus our faith in Christ. All of the questions at the beginning can be answered through that simple lens. Salvation, heaven, connection to God. Am I good enough? Am I going to make it? Did my parents make it? Is my child going to make it? All of those things can all be answered in. Is our faith, our trust, our, our trust that the only way we're going to get there is through Jesus. That's it. Over and over again, Paul said the same thing to the Galatian church, to the Ephesian church, to the Roman church, to the Corinthian church, letters we didn't read, all over the place. It's the same thing that Jesus told Thomas when he asked the question, how do we know how to get there? Jesus said, it's through me. That's it. There's no other way for us to get there. It all comes down to trusting that Jesus is the way. But I want to go back and look at those questions from the beginning because I think they each bring up unique points and unique perspectives that maybe some of us are really wondering about and questioning. So the first question, if you remember, was this. What about the people who believe in God but don't go to church? That's a valid question. Are they going to hell or are they going to heaven? Now the first distinction that I think we need to make here is that there is a difference between believing in God and putting our faith in Jesus. The two are not the same. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus himself, says, hey, believing in God, good for you. Even the demons believe in God, and they tremble in fear. So there is a definite difference between this kind of ambiguous, I believe that there's a higher power, I believe that there's a creator, and trusting 
that Jesus is the way to heaven. So if we assume that believe in God, hey, what about the people whose faith is in Jesus, let's say that, but don't go to church, where are they going? Well, going to heaven isn't based on anything that we can do. It's a decision to put our faith in Christ and that's it. So whether we go to church or not has no bearing in the matter. Whether we go to church or not doesn't disqualify us or qualify us as being able to get to heaven. It's simply faith in Jesus. But that doesn't mean that church isn't incredibly important and incredibly valuable for our lives. I know that it's, it's a very popular saying today to, to say that, hey, you know what, I can be a Christian and not go to church, which technically is true. You don't have to. Being a Christian means I've put my faith in Jesus and that's it. But church is incredibly important and incredibly valuable for our spiritual growth to maintain a, a close relationship with God, to feel his presence, to grow in our knowledge and understanding of him. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It's such a popular thing today as it was back then. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This guy says, hey, you know what? Let's not give up on going to church or being a part of the church. It is through the church, through services or small groups or classes, seminars, Bible studies, that you and I can learn about God's will for our life. That we can learn about God's values and what his heart is. It's through the church that you and I can develop relationships and, and be a part of what he's doing. And actually, if we want to get technical, the church isn't even a place that we go. The church isn't a building or a location. The church is people. The church is us. The church is a group of people coming together. It's, it's more something that you belong to, like a family, than something that you go to. And, and so it's through the church that you and I can develop those close relationships and hold each other accountable and challenge one another and encourage one another to keep following God, to, to keep searching you know, after his ways for our lives and learning more about him. It's through the church that we can partner with each other and be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. You know, the last series that we just finished last week, five things that God uses to grow your faith, four of those only happen within the context of this thing that we call church. Practical teaching, providential relationships, private disciplines, and personal ministry. Those all happen within the church. So, to answer the question, does going to church matter for me going to heaven or hell? Absolutely not. The only thing that matters is faith in Jesus. But church is incredibly important and we should make it a priority in our lives to stay connected and engaged and involved in a church. The second question that we talked about, <clears throat> what happens to babies after they die? Since they haven't sinned, are they separated from God or are they born into sin and therefore doomed? <clears throat> now this question isn't quite so cut and dry. There's not um, a definitive right or wrong answer here. And that's because there's two main schools of thought related to this issue. And one of them is called original sin, and one of them is called a sin nature. Now, you could spend years debating and researching the theology behind each one. Many people have. <clears throat> I'm just going to give you a quick 10-second overview. Original sin means that when children are born, when babies are born, they are born already sinful. They are born already imperfect and separated from God. And so therefore, something needs to be done. Some, some transaction or act needs to be done to, to bring them back to God or they wouldn't go to heaven if that child were to unfortunately die. So that's one school of thought. And while there are certainly very smart people and a lot of theologians who buy into that, on our side, my side personally, I don't believe that that is... Uh, as correct or as scripturally accurate. I know that Pastor Kevin, our lead pastor, doesn't either, and neither does our whole denomination, the Assemblies of God. We believe in something called a sin nature. And all that basically means is that kids, when they're born, are still pure and perfect and holy and 
if, God forbid, they were to die, they would go to heaven. But that there is a nature inside of kids, inside of each one of us, that is inescapable, it's inexplicable, that eventually one day we are going to sin against God and be separated from him. And so that's the difference between the two. But I think when you look at the vast majority of Scripture as a whole, when you look at God's character throughout the entirety of the Bible and you see his grace and his patience and his mercy, even when people don't deserve it, I think it's clearly safe to say that that same grace and mercy would extend to kids who don't understand the concepts yet of sin and separation from God and necessarily even right and wrong yet. I mean, if you, you look at Jesus and his example, there were many times that people, you know, wanted to keep kids away from Jesus. And he said, no, 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 let the little kids come to me. He encouraged people to have more of a childlike faith. In the Old Testament, children, boys at least, weren't held accountable for their actions until their bar mitzvah at age 12. In the New Testament, every single conversion account we have, every, every story that was written down of people coming to faith in Christ, we can safely assume that they were all adults, or at least of an age to make that decision on their own. There's actually a, a term that you won't find in the Bible anywhere, but it's called the age of accountability. And we just kind of made up, I mean, we personally didn't, but Christians have kind of made up this term to help explain this, that basically, if, if children are under a certain age where they can comprehend sin and separation from God, or even, even some adults, maybe, if they have some different handicaps or maybe can't mentally think at the same level as, um, as other adults, that we believe that God's grace extends to them under this age of accountability. Now, there's no set age, Okay, it's, a, it's a movable scale based on each person's development and maturity and intellect. But no matter which camp you find yourselves in, there is an incredible responsibility. If you are a parent, if you are a grandparent, if you are an aunt or uncle, if you're a caregiver of any type, there's an incredible responsibility that we have to raise our kids to be followers of Christ, to know to put their faith in Christ when they can understand it, to have that connection with God. And again, just like the previous question, this is another benefit of the church in our lives, is that we get to partner together and help one another and help develop a strong faith in the life of kids that we get to interact with. So what happens to babies when they die? We believe here that they can go straight to heaven and be connected with God because they have not sinned and have not separated from God and they don't need to put their faith in Jesus yet because of that. The last question today, what happens to someone when they die if they were baptized and confirmed as a child? Now, I think this is probably a really big one for our culture today, especially in our area. But this, too, can be answered through the lens of, well, is there faith in Christ? Is this person's trust in Jesus to get to heaven, or is there trust in baptism or confirmation? The Apostle Paul addressed this issue head on with the people of his time. And back when he was writing letters to churches, they didn't so much wonder about baptism or confirmation, but a big religious um, kind of ceremony or ritual for them was the act of circumcision, which, thank God, that is not a big deal today. <laughs> but <clears throat> They were wondering, hey, do I have to put my faith in Jesus and be circumcised? That's what some people were telling them. And Paul addresses this head on. He wants to make sure that the people reading the letter and those of us now in 2016 reading the letter understand this and get this. He says this in Galatians 5. Mark my words, okay? Don't miss this. Don't get the wrong idea. I am being as serious as serious can be right now. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you, that if you let yourselves be circumcised, if you're going to trust in that to get to heaven, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, and not just the act again, but who is going to let some of their trust be in this act that we can do, who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated then to obey the whole law. Hey, if you think one of the rules is going to matter, then you've got to think all the rules are going to matter. You 
who are trying to be justified by the law, who are trying to earn our way into heaven, who are trying to say, hey, God, thanks for Jesus, but I'm going to do some stuff on top of that. You have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. The way we get to heaven, again, is faith in Jesus. And that's it. There's nothing else that we can do to add to or subtract from that. Jesus is not going to share the spotlight. It's either all Jesus or it's no Jesus. It's either all grace or it's no grace. It's either I don't have to try and be good enough or I have to try and be good enough and there's no way out of that. And listen, I know that especially, especially in our culture today, maybe you might have some very deep-seated and deeply held convictions and beliefs about that. Don't, don't, uh, don't tune out, okay? I, I know that those are important, but according to, to what the Bible says, according to God, not me, according to God, the way we get to heaven is through nothing but faith in Jesus and faith in Jesus alone. If we're going to trust in any other act, in any other behavior, and I'm going to try, and I'm going to be sincere, whatever it might be, we are mistaken. However, However, if you had your kids baptized or you put them through confirmation, maybe your parents did for you, that was an incredible display of love and faith. Okay, don't, don't get the wrong idea. That was an incredible display either on your part or on your parents' part. Something to be celebrated, something to be upheld. What a great value that, that again, you or your parents wanted to hold and almost put a faith in your kids, if there's anything you could do, possibly you love them so much that you just want to do whatever you can for that. And that is, it's an incredible attitude, an incredible heart behind those actions. It's something that, as a church, that we want to celebrate and, again, uphold that same type of love. So rather than baptizing children, we do something here called child dedication. We believe that people should be baptized once they put their faith in Christ for themselves and not based off someone else. But the heart, again, that you had for kids, we want to honor that. And so child dedication is more of a scriptural example of thanking God for the gift of our kids and dedicating them back to him. That Hey, God, I'm going to raise them knowing that they are a gift from you, that I love them so much, and that I want them to be connected to you. We just did it last weekend. And it captures that same heart, that same essence. And the same thing is true with confirmation or any other spiritual formation classes. Look, if you put your kids through that or, or you went through it as a child, whatever it might be, how amazing that you got that opportunity. How incredible that you were involved and engaged in environments where you could learn knowledge about God, where you could learn his values, where you could interact with other people as, as those seeds of faith are planted inside. I mean, such an incredible head start that was given through that act, and it is truly an amazing thing. But none of those things get us to heaven. Great things, great things that we should honor and continue to do, but they don't get us to heaven. Any way you slice it, any way you look at it, from any angle or any language that we use, the issue of eternal security we can go back to go to that slide. <clears throat> the issue with eternal security can all be answered in is your faith in Christ? How do I know for sure that I'm going to get to heaven? It's because my faith is in Jesus. How can you know for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die? By putting your faith in Jesus. How can we be sure about our parents or grandparents or loved ones or friends or whatever it might be? How can we be sure about them? Faith in Jesus. Plain and simple. That's all it is. And so today, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you have never put your faith in Jesus, if you can't remember a time that you've done that, or maybe you did it when you were little and it's been a while, maybe you've walked away from that faith and want to come back, I want to pray for you. 
I want to give you an opportunity to do that today so that these issues and this tension of eternal security can be solved once and for all and that you can have peace and assurance in knowing that. So all we're going to do is we're going to say a, a short little prayer. There's no magic in the words or anything like that. But we're just going to tell Jesus that, hey, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to put my faith in you. But as we pray, I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to raise your hand when we pray. Now, in all honesty and just being completely transparent with you guys, this has nothing to do with God. Okay? If, if you want to put your faith in Christ, but you don't raise your hand when you pray, trust me, God still hears you, God still knows, you are good to go. But I want to ask you to raise your hand for us as a church. Because more than anything else, we as a group of people, our number one value is helping people discover a growing relationship with God by putting their faith in Jesus. And so when you raise your hand, we get to celebrate with you. We get to celebrate what God is doing in your life. We get to celebrate the fact that you are secure in your eternity. We get to celebrate the fact that you are making this huge decision and this step in your faith. We want to be able to celebrate what God is doing in our midst. And I know it can be uncomfortable. I know you might feel your stomach turning or your palms getting sweaty. But I want to encourage you to make a bold choice, a bold decision today. But again, I know it can be uncomfortable, so what I'm going to ask all of us to do at both locations is to close your eyes and bow your heads across the rooms, and at each site, there's just going to be, you know, two or three people in the back just looking for hands. And when I pray, if you want to put your faith in Christ, then pray along with me in your heart, and we would love to know and celebrate as you make that decision. So with everybody's eyes closed, let's take a moment and pray together. Father, we want to be secure in you. We want to know that we are going to heaven when we die. And Father, we are putting our trust in your son, Jesus, as the only way to get there. God, I know that we've maybe thought different things before. We've thought that it depended on our behaviors, our actions, but today we are surrendering those thoughts and we are putting our whole trust in your son, Jesus. And Father, I pray that as we do that, that you would give us peace, that you would give us calm in our hearts, and that most importantly, God, you would give us a joy as we start to discover a relationship with you and as we look forward to the glory of being with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.